will be available for pastoral care if it is needed. Um, reminder, these Sunday services are viewable on YouTube. Go to YouTube, look for one of this congregation. You can find it. Also, go to our web page and there's a link there. There's some good stuff to review. Um, next Tuesday at 7 p.m., as every Tuesday at 7 p.m. is Taco Tuesday. Uh, this week, Reverend Ellen will be uh, facilitating it, and we just, half a dozen, dozen of us get together and we just talk. It's really nice. Uh, May 22nd is our annual congregational meeting. We elect officers and vote on a budget, which is a quick reminder, we're still in the stewardship drive, so please get those pledge cards in because they use the pledge cards. Finance committee uses those cards to fix the budget that will be presented for us to vote on May 22nd. Um, this Sunday, Children's RE, the, the le lesson is titled, Nothing to Do. So it's a, a lesson on doing nothing. Um, right now for a quick minute, if Steve Shirley would come up, he's got an announcement about our spirit level grant for technology and the men's f fellowship. So thank you, Steve. Okay, my name's Steve Shirley, and um, I've been uh, uh, making announcements periodically. I've been away from, from uh, church here by DeBeneville, either work weekends or the men's weekend, which I'll get to in a minute. But we're now at, uh, let me grab the thermometer. Uh, we now have collected $10,650. That leaves uh, 1,850 to go. So that means uh, in practical terms that we need somewhere between three and six new uh, uh, donors or people that can uh, donate an additional amount toward our matching fund. Once we get to 12,500, we'll send our paperwork in from the bookkeeper and they'll send us a check for the other half, 12,500 more. First project will be to get a projector somewhere hanging in that area and a screen somewhere uh, this side of the kind of three round lights that are recessed into the ceiling. And uh, so it's really gonna start moving. If you haven't had a chance, take a look at our control room. We've remodeled it and uh, to great effect, I think. Now the other point is this shirt. Uh, I was just at the uh, UU Men's Fellowship weekend, and uh, it was the very best of uh, all of them. Uh, and uh, every March, so I'll be reminding us about that. And also take a look at DeBeneville's calendar, uh, uucamp.org, and uh, see if some of those inter items interest you. Thank you. Thank you very much. There's lots happening with us. We are in a happening place. <laughs> and it is good to be here with you this morning. Um, greetings to all 14 of those joining us in the Zoom sanctuary. Welcome, warm welcome to you. It is our tradition that we open our service with a ringing of the bowl. We ring it three times. Once for those who came before. The original stewards of this land who called it home long, long ago. We also honor our ancestors and the founding members of this congregation who imagined it over 70 years ago. Once for those of us here and now. 
for our members, friends, and visitors, our staff, and our extended UU family who hold, care, and grow this beloved community that we know as our own. And once for those who will come, for all who will find belonging here with us and call this their spiritual home in the days ahead. I invite you to stand as you're comfortable, even if you're at home and you feel like standing up and moving, as we do a little singing together. We're gonna do two songs as a medley. First, we'll sing Gathered Here, 389, and then Lily will work her magic and we'll blend into Spirit of Life. I hope you enjoy this. And before we start, I um, wanted to try and do Gather Here as a draft. So, um, if you take a look at the music, 389, uh, we're going to sing it once all the way through together, and then we're going to split into two parts. We're not going to do all four parts, we're just going to do two parts. The first part, let's do this side of the congregation, and we're going to start at number one. And then that side of the congregation will start at number three. And we will sing it as a round two more times all the way through. So a total of three times, and the choir will help guide us as well. So here we go. like to invite my husband George to come up and light our chalice this morning. As I offer these words, 
When we listen with the ears of our hearts, we hear the words that have been offered in this very holy place, lighting the chalice of this congregation over the past 70 years. We invite this, the breath of our ancestors. As we breathe together and join our spirits in this sanctuary now, with hearts wide open, we mark this very moment with great joy, deep gratitude, and an authentic optimism. Optimism that the love and intention that we create here among us remains a light to those yet to find this sacred space. This home for their spirit, where the size of their breath will bring long life to this chalice flame. Amen and blessed be. I invite you to join me now in the speaking of our covenant. The words will be on the screen. And we thank Don Moore for his service as our AV tech today. Thank you, Don, very much. Thank you. And we wish our regular tech, Lily Noah Roberts, a wonderful day away from our Sunday service. Let's speak together. Love of this congregation, the quest of truth, its sacrament, and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, to serve the world in fellowship, to the end that all souls shall grow in harmony with the divine. Thus do we covenant with each other. Thanks so much. And I invite Letha Comstock up to, for sharing our wisdom tale for the day, A Time for All Ages, The Night Bird. The Night Bird. Long ago, in the Russian forests and steppe, the Roma people traveled far and wide in separate bands. They camped in the forests and fields and made their fortunes in the villages they visited. Life was good when they were on the road and on their own. Life was good, unless one group of Roma ran, ran into another. Then the chiefs were quick to disagree about everything, especially territory. The disagreements led to insults. The insults turned to fistfights. And, long, and before long, one and then another young man would die. When Merisi was a small boy, he heard of the wagons of the other Roma bands. He retreated into the folds of his mother's skirts and begged her to not let them fight. She shrugged her shoulders. What could she do? Baro Sharo was the chief. She had no say. When Morrissey was a little older, he grabbed hold of his father and the other men and begged them not to fight. They shrugged their shoulders. What could they do? It was Baro Sharo who demanded they fight. They had no say. When Morrissey was a young man, he approached the leaders of other bands and begged them not to fight. They laughed at him and asked whether he was really a man. The fighting and the unnecessary deaths were just part of life and nothing they could change. Marcia's sorrow grew until finally he could stand it no more. He bid well, farewell to his family and disappeared somewhere deep in the forest. No amount of calling or searching would bring him back. He was gone. Marcia had always been a gentle soul but alone in the forest, he grew bitter. Why had they not listened to him? Alone in the forest, he grew angry. He died, and in his place came a night bird with a haunting soul. Some years later, Marcia's band returned to the place where he had disappeared. It felt ominous there, and yet they set up their encampment in the clearing. That evening, when the chores had been done and the campfire burned, no one sang or danced. They huddled about the fire without saying a word. 
It was a young boy who was first to hear the night bird call. It seemed to be calling him. He felt he had no choice as to follow it, the sound of the bird into the forest. By the time his family finally realized he was gone, it was too late. They couldn't find him. All wanted to leave that place, yet there was nothing that made them stay. The next night, they huddled around the fire in silence again. It was a youth who heard the night bird call. Now it was calling him. He felt mesmerized as he followed the sound of the bird into the forest. By the time his family realized he was gone, it was too late. The next day, everyone wanted to leave that bleak pace, but Barasharo, the chief, would not or could not budge. He sat all day long with his chin in his hands. That evening when the campfire burned, everyone could hear the night bird call. Sharo jumped up. It is for me, the night bird calls. It has been after me all along, and it is I who must go. I am sorry for my worrying ways. I have done wrong. The night bird calls for peace. When I go, so too shall our warring ways. Barashura walked off into the forest, never to be seen again. After that, as though it were a catchy fiddle tune, peace spread throughout the land. The Russian Roma people began to live in harmony with one another. Since then, the night bird has continued to call, but its call is no longer hyp hypnotic. It is the reminder of Shero pledge for peace. Let's hope that that night bird's call will continue to be heard today and that leaders all around the world will hear it. Perhaps we can call it. Thank you. Beautiful, thank you, Letha. I'd like to invite Riley up, if you'd like to, to come and get the chalice. And then we will sing you, and if we got any other children here today, off to your, your version of church. You can take the chalice as we sing the reeds in the insert in your order service. We have something very special as part of our stewardship drive, and we will have Maribel Dana share with us why she pledges. Welcome, Maribel. Good morning, all of you here and online. Um, I was asked to speak about why I pledge. And part of that goes with the question of how did I come to be at Monte Vista? Why did I leave my previous church homes with the United Church of Christ in Corona and later the Presbyterians? Well, in 1987 at the Corona UCC, our dear Reverend Edgar Cook, an orator, whose words often summon tears to his eyes and ours, uh, he retired. A religious liberal, he would have been shocked to learn of the successor minister. The successor began to preach frequently against GLBT people and on at least two occasions against a woman's right to choose. I began standing up and leaving the service. So I decided to follow the church that was meeting in our basement, which uh, were the Presbyterians. Doctors Covell and Phyllis Hart, a husband and wife team, had been using the basement to establish a new ministry in Corona, and they had tried to retire a few times, and they kept getting called back to start churches. 
they had been missionaries in India and in Israel, and they supported the indigenous people's movement everywhere. Wonderful couple. And then in 1994, danged if they didn't retire, and a younger, more conservative guy took their places. Kept wondering what was going on here. And as I wrote my monthly pledge checks, each time I began to feel depressed. Seriously. I kept hoping things would improve. And finally, one Sunday, I had had enough. The new reverend began to preach about multiculturalism and world religions. And near the end, he stated that the idea of religions being similar, the idea that many great roads could lead to the same path of redemption or enlightenment or whatever, was insane. He was certain of that. And there was only one way, truth and light. I'll bet you can guess. That night, I wrote a short letter of resignation from the fellowship and sent it to Reverend Mike. I wanted to state my reasons and not just go gently, gently into that good departure and let him think I'd disappeared out of boredom. I wanted him to think about another view. I spoke about historic weaknesses in any ancient scripture. I also acknowledged his hard work and kind ways. You know, never just hit somebody between the eyes without a soft word. I ended with my plan to join the Unitarian Universalists, a people who try to live by their seven principles, searching for truth with reason that is often accompanied by modest and sincere uncertainty. I sent the letter off and I felt liberated. I should have just disappeared. My letter resulted in a five-page letter from him going point by point over the perceived flaws in my letter. And later, my son's friend said that the Sunday school teacher told his classmates that our family was lost and no longer on the path to heaven. The Sunday school teacher was his wife. Am I glad to be here because I considered the alternatives? I pledged to Monta Vista because I feel good doing so. It's a bit selfish, really. I pledge because we don't know all the answers, not even all the questions, and we admit it. I pledge because of dear people I've met here and the legacy of those we've lost, rare souls like Evelyn Falkins, Bob Minnick, Ellen Williams, Sashiko Starks, and more recently, Frank and Adrian Amon, Nella and Harry Ragland, Barbara Dev, Nick Livingston, and recently, Nancy Rutherford and Eleanor Martindale. We have to keep a home with doors open wide for people like them, for people like yourselves, and for people who haven't yet crossed the threshold. So please get your pledges in. Not everybody has done so yet. And we want to keep this place open and thriving and growing. Thank you. Those that don't know, I'm Carissa. I'm, I'm, I'm the chair of the finance, finance and, and as seen in that, in that video, video killer, killer, last, last week, week, amazing, amazing city sent out, out to the congregation, congregation and you and received, received a pledge, pledge card, card or a thank, a thank you with, with flowers, flowers to continue your theme, theme of, of Rooted, rooted and grow. And, grow. and, and I've, I've got a go. 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 Um, um, the committee will be finalizing our budget next week. 
So if your pledge has been received by midday, Monday, May 9th, we will be able to include it in the budget. The budget will be sent out to the congregation by Saturday, May 14th, in time for the budget info meeting after the service on May 15th. The budget will then go to the Board of Trustees on May 18th, and it will then come up for a vote on May 22nd at the congregational meeting after the service. Now our pledge totals as of Monday, April 25th, we have had 18 pledge units, which equates to 23 members, pledging a total of $54,640. Now this is roughly one third of our congregation. Now we're still waiting on some info but current estimates are showing that we will need about $145,000 in pledges in order to accommodate all of the budget requests made by our committees and still meet our other financial obligations like, you know, bills, salaries, that sort of thing. But given how much one third of the congregation has donated, if the other two thirds of the congregation steps up, we should make we should make that total. And I'm very, very hopeful that we can achieve that. And I look forward to seeing what y'all can do. Thank you. Thank you, Carissa. And thank you to Bob Taylor. He and Megan are away today. They're up in along the coast, those lucky dogs. <laughs> but he sure made sure that we had that message here for us. So that was that was Bob's hands mailing in his pledge, setting the example. So yeah. So I want to thank you for being exactly who you are and for your generous hearts. And as we wind down the last few weeks of our fiscal year and gather to adopt our budget for the year ahead, let's take this moment to offer our gratitude for the ways that we've stepped up and stepped in to keep our financial commitments and support our community and the work that we've been doing together. Sharing is a privilege and it's an expression of compassion that blesses us individually and as a congregation. Giving generously from a grateful heart is one way that we live out our desire to be good stewards of this congregation, because this church is our church. And we support it through the gifts of our time and our talents and our treasure. So we invite you to bring your offerings online if you're here with a phone in your hand and you want to do it that way. Or for those who are visiting us in the Zoom sanctuary, if Don, if you could put the link to the PayPal into the uh, chat box, that would be great. If you wish to bring an offering that you have with you, um, please come forward now and we have a basket up front to receive those. And um, we also have a basket here for our non-perishable donations for the Beta Center at the Inland Valley Hope Partners. So it is with that very deep gratitude for the many gifts of our community that the offering will now be given and received. Yes, that is a prayer, that sigh, that ah, oh, yes. Thank you, Lily. It is our tradition to share the things in our lives that are delighting us and some of those things that are pretty disappointing. It seems that bringing them here and looking at them together and sharing them is a healing and joyful um, thing that we can do to live out our lives together in, co in community. We have uh, little slips of paper by our doors, so for those in the sanctuary, if you have anything that you ever want to have announced during this um, segment, you could just sign one of these, and we have a basket on the table there to put them in. I have this one from today. It comes from Don Moore, who's hiding in the what we used to call the sound closet, but it's now control room. Yeah, so Don is in control. 
That feels good. I feel safe with that. <laughs> Thank you, Don. Um, and his, um, his prayer request is a joy. It says, I've been so grateful to get to spend Tuesday evenings at Taco Tuesday. Yeah. And those of us that are there with you, enjoy having you there. Thank you. Um, Don, if you could put that picture up that I had given you on the flash drive. This is another joy that we have. And it comes all the way from the other side of the world. Look what we have. Yeah, Julie Steinbach was um, wonderful and sent me this picture. This is Ralph. He is the, the son of Maricel Kino. That is her baby who was born on April 22nd. So 4-22-22. So we welcome him to the world. Welcome, Ralph. As an expression of our memory of a recent loss that we've had in our congregation with the death of Eleanor Martindale, I'm um, remembering that the last time we were together, um, we had said that we would have a candle lighting ceremony in memory of Eleanor. She died at the age of 91 years on Easter Sunday. She found herself too weak to go down to the dining room for Easter brunch, despite her wishes that all of her children come and share that special meal with her over at Claremont Place. She told her daughter, Jenna, you all just go down and eat, and I'll rest, and then we'll have our visit after. We'll enjoy some time together. So while the family was eating together, um, which was always one of Eleanor's favorite events to get her family together over food, um, Eleanor was found unresponsive, and she died very peacefully as her family came back to her room and gathered around her. There is an African saying that says, another great tree has fallen and is gone from the canopy. An author, Stephen Jenkinson, adds that the light that that lets in is harsh. So I, I invite you now to honor the life of Eleanor as we together come forward and we light a candle in her memory.
Please join me in a spirit of prayer. We lean on the spirit of life and love in this time as we suffer, as we grieve, and as violence and division rage. We hold those of us who feel the pain of loss and who feel anger at injustice. We hold the oppressed and hope for change in the heart of the oppressor, for we know that both are joined in their humanity and joined with us as well. May the spirit of life and love help us remember the hope that we have had, the hope that we have seen, and the hope that we will give to the hopeless. May the spirit of life and love help us to remember joy in the midst of sadness, success in the midst of challenge, and loving kindness in the midst of struggle. May the spirit of life and love help us to be better people, to work for better things, and to co-create a better world. May it be so. Amen. And blessed be. Please remain seated as we sing together hymn number 1031 in the Teal Hymnal, filled with loving kindness. We'll sing it through three times. The first verse is I, the second we sing you, and in the third we sing we. Kathleen McTeague. It's titled Mending the Broken World. It's from her book Shine in Shadow. In early September, I stopped to watch my neighbor at work repairing a stone wall that lines the road perpendicular to ours. Built as all the old field walls of our region have been built, the stones are held by balance and judicious choice rather than by mortar. The wall was built well, but the weight of many decades has broken it here and there, with some stones falling out of place or carried away for some other use. As I warm myself in the autumn sun and watch him work, I see that about half of what he does is simply look at the stones in their haphazard piles, stroking his chin in thought, then, from time to time, he rolls one from the pile onto the ground and turns it from side to side, pondering. 
or walks back to study again the place in the wall he's trying to mend. When he finally makes his choice, he's sure. Each stone waits for that right opening. The place where its particular heft and shape fit as though cradled. Once in place, it is no longer merely a stone, but an essential piece of the wall. Part of a larger thing taking shape as naturally as a tree flows from root to trunk to branch. My neighbor is an ordinary working man. I know his name and sometimes we talk together about life and horses and his willingness to help me haul manure to my garden one of these days before the first hard frost. But on this sunny September afternoon, as I watch his eyes and hands become familiar with each stone and then lift it to shape the wall, it's easy to imagine God at work in the immense universe, quietly humming, pulling our lives together into something strong and useful. I don't mean we're mute or helpless, waiting passively for the great stonemason to lift and move our lives or tell us where we belong. I mean only that there is a place for us, that our gifts, the shape of our minds and talents, the angles of our interest and concern, fit the needs of the world the way my neighbor's stones anchor themselves in the lengthening wall. I mean that the world's possibilities shift and change each time we put ourselves into building something large and strong and beautiful. Whether or not we find room in our theology for the word God, the world itself calls to imagine ourselves essential to this engaged holiness, bringing forth what is ours to give of creation and strength toward mending the broken world. Growing up in the 60s, our family had an annual tradition that we celebrated each March. Mom's sister, our aunt Colleen, would come over and we'd help her to make, a, maybe you'll remember one of these, Chef Boyardee pizza from the box. Yuck. Yeah, oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> and the nine of us kids would watch The Wizard of Oz together on a very small screen TV. A part of that tradition also included nightmares about flying monkeys and tornadoes. <laughs> but actually, one of the more curious takeaways from that classic film, and it is rich, was the unspoken message that Dorothy's companions were somehow broken. Each of them seeks something that they lack. Scarecrow needed a brain. Tin Man needed a heart, and the Cowardly Lion needed courage. One might wonder why the Cowardly Lion's character flaw became part of his name. It's as if lacking courage had more shame attached to it than the unmet needs that his companions struggled with. It's curious because we don't name the others brainless Scarecrow or heartless Tin Man, do we? But the Cowardly Lion has been an archetype for a lack of courage since L. Frank Baum's novel was first published in 1900 and Hollywood created this iconic film in 1939. So let's unfold that just a bit and cut him some slack <laughs> because what if, you know, what if? What if instead of seeing his floundering courage as shameful the lion taught us that allowing ourselves to be a bit fragile and pursuing love and justice anyway shows the greatest amount of courage. Author Marianne Rodmacher is quoted as saying, courage doesn't always roar. Sometimes courage is the quiet voice at the end of the day saying, I will try again tomorrow. What if we find in the end that it's not the courage that we work so hard to muster or the courage we hope that will be granted us by the wizard that we should seek, but a greater love for our capacity to be tender and curious and kind and fragile 
in the midst of hard days and bone deep transformation. What if that is our calling? Not that we buck up and use all of our life force to create a kind of fierce courage from our deepest core, fighting, gritting our teeth, stockpiling our weapons against any threat. When we do that, we're pushing down the call to tend to that fragility of our souls, and we're ignoring the brokenness of our world. What if our calling is that our tender hearts and our broken bits are what most need tending? That our wounds hold the most wisdom, and that as we reach to embrace a sense of restoration, we might just need to let go of any expectation that we must keep pushing to be braver, stronger, more resilient, and instead see that being fragile and tender shows that we have strong hearts and great courage, and that is enough for now. Aren't we tired of having to be strong? Amanda Dodson is a social worker whose January article in Psychology Today resonates with our message for today. She writes in part, I became a therapist to help people empower themselves to live better lives, but instead I find now that most people are exhausted and squeezed by illness, climate change, and predatory capitalist systems, and, and, and. We love stories about people who come from terrible circumstances and through hard work and luck manage to find peace and happiness. But how realistic is it that we should expect that in these times? Resilience and resistance ask much of us right now. Stepping away to care for our fragility is difficult work. It takes a great deal, great deal of courage to unpack. We might even find that searching for meaning within all that has come into our lives is too difficult to begin right now. And it may really be too soon anyway. So instead, instead, let us truly bear witness to our fragility and our fragile world. Let's be present to that. Let's rest and listen with the ears of our hearts. Thank you, St. Benedict. Let's resist any sense of urgency to make meaning from what we're going through. Let's put off the search for clarity in all of this at, that at this time. And let's hold on. Let's hold on and do all we can to stay well and to stay close to stay connected to the strength of our faith and our spiritual practices that are so essential in times like this. Acknowledging the courage it takes to admit and explore how fragile things are right now isn't pessimistic, but it is grounding. Grounding in our faith and in our liberal community gives us sea legs and supports us on our very courageous journeys, knowing that there is no judgment, no lessons to be learned, no hidden meaning that we need to earn the keys to, no deeper purpose for the suffering that we see. But instead, we choose to wonder with a holy curiosity and learn from an exploration of the sometimes baffling nature of life. We see and see the fragility of all things, and with courage, we embrace it and each other. Amen and blessed be. Please join me, and those in the sanctuary that are comfortable standing, as we sing verse 1 in 4 of hymn number 354 from the gray hymnal, singing the living tradition. 354, we laugh, we cry, verse one and four.
into this day as a grateful maker of peace with a wide open heart. Let's go bless the world. <laughs>